Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This episode has been sponsored by Bookhampton. As the premier independent bookstore in the Hamptons, Bookhampton has a highly curated selection of books for readers of all ages, unique one-of-a-kind gifts, and exciting author events. Browse their fabulous staff suggestions online at bookhampton.com. I'm excited to be here today with Jessica Turner. Jessica N. Turner is the author of The Fringe Hours, Making Time for You, a best-selling book, and is the author of lifestyle blog, The Mom Creative. Her latest book, Stretch Too Thin, How Working Moms Can Lose the Guilt, Work Smarter, and Thrive, the website for that is stretchtothinbook.com, came out in September 2018. A frequent speaker on work-life balance, productivity, and faith, Jessica lives in Nashville, Tennessee with her husband and three young children. You can follow her on Instagram at Jessica N. Turner or at Book Snobbery. Hey, Jessica, thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Hey there, I'm so glad to be here. So what prompted you to write the book Stretch Too Thin? Were you feeling stretched too thin yourself as a mom? You know, I hear that question a lot, and the complicated answer is yes and no. I mean, I had signed a two-book deal, my first book. I knew what I was going to write. The first book is called The Fringe Hours, Making Time for You, and I didn't know what I was going to do next. And at first I thought I would write a book about slowing down. And after six months of trying to do that, I realized I wasn't the person for that. (laughs) Um, And so I thought, well, what do I know? Well, I know what it is like to have a full-time job, a career and a couple kids and a marriage and that it can really feel overwhelming. And so I did a survey of working moms just to kind of gut check if this might be something worth pursuing and had over 2,000 women respond in just a couple days, had, I gosh, I think probably 500 pages of open-ended responses. And over and over and over again, the women said the phrase stretched too thin. And so I thought, you know what? I think I've got something here. <laughs> How did you find the women for your survey? So I'm a blogger. I've been blogging since 2006. And so most of it was just through my online platform as well as friends sharing about the survey as well. So we were able to get women from across the country, those who work full-time, part-time, at home, in an office, in a retail setting, all types of jobs and positions. So it was a really well-rounded survey, which I was really pleased with. And what were some of the surprising, were there any surprising findings, I should say, among this group of women? You know, I think the most surprising statistic was that most women didn't say that they had troubles with work boundaries which I felt like maybe they don't know how they define those boundaries. Because for me, I would say if I'm looking at work email at night, that means that I don't have a great boundary in place with that. But I think it has become so ingrained in the way we do life that we just have this little computer in our hand all the time that we don't even recognize that that's a boundary that we don't have in place. So I think when I talk with women, anecdotally, it seems like a lot of women have trouble with boundaries with work, but the survey didn't really reflect that. Got it. And what were the most consistent findings in your survey, aside from feeling stretched too thin? I think the... Biggest no surprises here were that the two biggest struggles for working moms were that they struggled with home management. Four out of five cited that as being a challenge, and four out of five cited self care as being a challenge. And I think that is not a surprise to any of us. I'm trying to get women to think that reading is a form of self care, right? It's an easy, the easiest one to do, right? You just like pick up it a book. Absolutely, you don't is, have to. Right? Run, you don't have to jump in a bathtub or something crazy, right? You just have to <laughs> open up a book. That's so true. I think that it, and you know what, data backs that up because my first book, The Fringe Hours, I also did online research and did a survey. And the number one thing that women said they would do if they had more time was read. Uh, And it's so funny because it's the easiest thing to do, right? Like you can read your Kindle app on your phone or you can be listening to a book while you're doing chores. I mean, you can read anywhere. So I agree with you 100%. I think people maybe feel too much pressure to finish lots and lots of books. But I'm like, if you read two pages a night, a friend just emailed me today, like, oh, but I I only read two pages a night. It takes me a month to finish a book. And I'm like, but that's great. A book a month. How great is that? Anyway, I'm getting off topic. But uh, I love it. (laughs) So you say in the book that you want moms to be able to say with pride, quote, I love my family. I do great work. I'm thriving. So if you, you have a bazillion tips in this book and it is so useful and amazing and I'm like going to use it as my Bible. But what are some of the best tips that moms who are listening now could take out of it and take away? My biggest tip is for women to track their time for a week. And that is an exercise where you literally write down everything that you're doing throughout the week. Just like we track our food or we track our steps or our calories 
calories, you're tracking all of your activities. So not just the big things. You're not just writing work for eight hours, but you're actually writing what you're doing within that. You're writing if you're taking a lunch break, you're writing the drop-off line and soccer practice and all those things because I think that it gives you a really great perspective in what you're doing, where your time is going, and where there's opportunities to make change. So that's step number one. Step number two is to take care of yourself and really give yourself that permission to practice self-care. It is that oxygen mask philosophy that you've got to take care of yourself before you can take care of anyone and everything else. And you're going to be the best wife, the best mom, the best friend, the best coworker when you're taking care of yourself. So make that a priority. Even if you have to put yourself on the calendar, do the things that you need to do to take care of yourself. And self-care is so much more than massages and manicures, right? It is our health. It's going to the doctor. It is getting enough sleep drinking enough water, it's eating well, it's doing those things that bring us joy, like reading. It's also making time for community and making time to be with friends. I think that's another important piece that a lot of women miss. So number two would be to practice self-care. Number three is to recognize that you're not going to be able to overhaul everything. If you're stretched too thin in all of the areas that I talk about in the book, because every chapter I break down a different pain point for working moms, listen, I get it, but you're not going to be able to change all of those things. So start with one thing. If home management is a struggle and then within home management, your kitchen is always a hot mess. Okay, start with just one thing and then build on that. I like it. Small steps. (laughs) So one of the things you say in the book is you recommend moms spend less time on social media. And yet you are this like giant social media star and, you know, just online, social media, your blog, everything. What's the best way for moms to approach social media, do you think, working moms? So just because I have a business that's based online doesn't mean that I don't have good boundaries in place. And so I think the theme here is having boundaries with that, you know. So uh, for me, I schedule my content so that I'm not glued to it 24-7. And I have an assistant that helps me manage some things. And I write on weekends, so I'm not having to work every single day necessarily on online content and that sort of thing. So I think that it is really good to check on how much social media you're consuming because so much comes from social media that isn't good, like comparison and jealousy and guilt and all of these types of feelings. And so I think recognizing that in yourself, I know I was noticing a season where I was getting really jealous and I was like, where is this coming from? And it was a few profiles. And so I unfollowed those people (laughs) so that then that toxicness wasn't impacting my day-to-day life. So it's really personal. The new iPhone interface, you know, tracks how much time (laughs) you're doing, which Horrifying. Really horrifying. Yeah, really horrifying. Um, it's horrifying to me every week. Although I did realize that Audible is counted in like that average hour. And I was like, okay, well, it's a little better if I know that, but it's still, it's still alarming. It's a lot for sure. So it's something that you've got to make personal changes for. For some women, they'll find deleting the apps from their phone and then just checking them on their laptops is a good way to go because then there isn't that aimless scrolling. I like to say women who say they don't have time to read, but then they're on, you know, their iPhones four hours a day looking at Instagram and Facebook. Well, there you go. There's opportunity right there. Oh, I like it. Just swap out all that time. Now we have like a actual goal. That's excellent. Is the smarter Hyatt smarter system, is that the tracking that you were just referring or is the smarter system even more of that? I know it, it's an acronym for lots of different steps, but could you take me through the smarter system? Sure. So the smarter system is actually a goal tracking system. So it's not something related to time tracking or media consumption or anything like that. So smarter, there's smart goals are pretty a pretty popular vernacular, but smarter is something that Michael Hyatt developed and it stands for specific, measurable, actionable, risky, time keyed, exciting, and relevant. And so these are words that you use as you write goals for yourself. And I think goals are really important because they give us motivation and grounding and direction. And so often we'll set goals for our businesses or the work that we do, but we don't do them in our personal lives. And so I encourage women to use that little acronym of SMARTER to set good goals for themselves that they can keep themselves accountable for. Are there any particular goals that you use for yourself? They vary based on the season, but I have goals for my personal development. I have goals for the work that I'm doing. I have goals for me as a mom that I pay attention to and goals for my own personal health, you know, whether that is exercise or how I'm eating, those types of things. But using that lens has been really powerful for me. What are the some of the things like on a crazy afternoon, like let's pretend I'm standing in your living room in, at like 4.30 in the afternoon or something and you're, or, you, you're, or maybe later, let's say 6.30, right? Because you're off of work and you're home and everything's crazy. 
every, and everybody's screaming. I'm just, well, I'm assuming sometimes your kids scream. My kids scream. What do you do in that moment when you're feeling just totally overwhelmed? And you are like the author of this book, right? Like you can't, you have all the tips at your disposal. What and I do, probably yell. Like, I mean, I, I'm normal, <laughs> right? Like they say that you write from what you know well. So in those times where I'm really overwhelmed, I'm absolutely just like the rest of us. But I think what I've learned is I'm quick to apologize if that is the way that I react. I'm quick to get down on my knees and get at the eye level of my kids and talk to them. I think that it's important for our kids to see our humanity, right? So I don't think that that makes me a a better person just because I've written stretched too thin. No, I'm right (laughs) in the muck of it during those moments. But, you know, at 630, we were probably just wrapping up dinner and getting ready for baths and checking homework and that sort of thing. But I really try to be intentional about the time that I have with my kids. So because I work a traditional corporate job, I'm gone a lot. And so during that time when I'm home from about 545 till they go to bed at eight, I do really want to be present. So you probably won't find my phone attached to me. It's probably in my purse or it's in the dining room. We actually are old school instead of a landline. So we feel like if there's a real emergency, the people who need to reach us know that number. So hopefully I'm not screaming. Hopefully we're snuggled up on the couch watching Food Network or something like that Mm -hmm. or reading stories or that type of thing. But that doesn't happen every night. (laughs) So when do you do everything. So you have a traditional corporate job. Is it involving writing at all or blogging? or? Yeah, I work in marketing for a large healthcare company doing mostly social media content strategy and development. Nice. So you do that and then you have a blog, which is super popular and it you've been doing for a while, and you write books. So when do you find the time to do this? If you're totally present with your kids until they go to bed, are you using your weekends or I'm not asking like I'm looking for suggestions here on how to find, find time too. So any tips, you know? So I think that you always can find time for things that are important to you. And so if we use the book for an example, I got up at 4.30 or 5 and would get ready to leave for the day and would often leave the house by 5.30 and be writing from 6 until 8.30. And then I worked my job all day. For the blog, it's kind of the same thing. I'll get up early to do some writing. And then on weekends, I would take about a half day on Saturday and a half day on Sunday to work. But I would get up really early again so I wouldn't miss out on a whole lot of time with the kids. You know, I'd be back home by noon or 1 o'clock and so we'd still have the majority of the day together. But the book was written in small bites of 500, 1,000, 2,000 words at a time. And you have a long time to write a book. So I was able to do that over the course of probably four to six months to get the book written. And the same with the blog. You know, I'm just working on the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, and not getting too in the weeds of what I need to do a month or two months from now um, because I don't have that capacity. It's also been really important for me to not compare myself to bloggers who do it full time which would be really easy for me to do, particularly if I looked at, you know, how many followers we have or what our traffic is like. I'd be able to say, oh, look, we're really equal, but we're not because I'm not able to put the same amount of time into it. So um, that's saying no to some opportunities. It's streamlining some things. It's writing things that I'm only really passionate about and that I think makes sense for my audience. That makes sense. That's a good framework for that. When you talked in your book about relationships and how, you know, having enough time for your relationship is always a challenge, one tip you gave was reading together for how spouses or significant others could not be so much of a challenge. And I'm literally reading a book right now out loud to my husband because we both want to read it so badly. So I was, I'm reading it out loud to him and I was like, wait, I thought I was the only one who did that. What other things aside from reading together do you suggest couples do to sort of stay glued together more at least emotionally, during the chaos of child rearing? I think it's really important to just make time for one another. And that can be as simple as playing a game or reading together like you're doing. It doesn't necessarily have to mean going out, although I think going out can be a great way to reconnect and commit to not talking about kids and not talking about the house, but really talking about what one another are feeling and doing and listening and being present and putting our phones down. It it is just an active commitment to invest in one another because here's the thing, hopefully our children are going to leave someday, right? And so when they do, (laughs) we have an empty nest, 
all we're left with is our spouses. And there's so many marriages that their kids leave and they're left with brokenness because they haven't invested in one another. And so I think that it's just really important to commit to investing in one another, even during these tiring, hard little years. Okay, will do. I'm going to note that and try to do more of that this week. So I think I was maybe just really emotional when I got to your chapter seven after like a particularly trying day with the kids. But in your chapter seven, which is titled Parenting Well, you start and say, as we begin this chapter, first and foremost, know this. You are a great mom. The very fact that you are reading this book tells me, don't beat yourself up. And I literally just like started crying. I was like, thank you. Someone thinks I'm a good mom today. (laughs) So I just sort of wanted to thank you for for putting that in there. Do you think that part of good parenting is researching and trying to find more information about parenting? Or was it just more of a kind of a joke? But what do you think? No, I don't think that you necessarily are a better person or parent if you are researching. I think that you are created for your child. Like nobody else was meant to be your child's mom. And so I I think that in and of itself is really powerful and that we can become so distracted. I think particularly by social media when we're looking at everyone's highlight reels of what everyone is doing and how they're doing it or reading all of these books. I think books can be a really useful guide. But ultimately, I think we have what we need within ourselves and that every single mom's a great mom out there. I don't think anyone sets out to be a mom thinking that they're going to be terrible or that they don't want to do a good job. And we're all just doing it a little different and that's okay. So if you don't mind, tell me a little more about the process of getting this two book deal. So what happened? You were writing a blog and do you got a lot of, well, just tell me, I won't fill in the blanks. How did you go from writing your blog into the two book deal? And tell me more about that, please. So it's important to know from my story that my husband is an author and he He's been writing full-time since 2003. He has published about 20 books for grown-ups, but now writes kids' books. His best-selling book, When God Made You, has sold more than 100,000 copies. And so he has a really phenomenal story and background. So I'm fortunate because I live with someone who does this really well for a living. And so I had that perspective. Being a blogger, I know a lot of authors and I'm friends with a lot of authors and always said that I was never going to write a book. That's something that was great for them, but wasn't something that I had an appetite for. And I was at a blogging conference called Alt a few years ago and was in a segment or a program about time management. And during that session, the title, The Fringe Hours, came to me. And it sounds dramatic, but I really felt like it was an act of obedience to write a book called The Fringe Hours. It was not something I wanted to do. It was not something I I had capacity to do. Um, At the time, I had just two kids and just really was overwhelmed by it, but felt like I needed to. Came home from that conference, immediately started a book proposal. I found an agent because I didn't want to have the same agent as my husband. I just thought that would be weird. And she started shopping the book. And I said, I just want to write this one book. I don't want to do anything else. I just feel like this is something I need to do. She said, okay. And nearly every publisher we pitched the book to wanted to buy it. And so that was very fun and exciting and had a big bidding war. And it came down to two publishers and both publishers wanted a two book deal. And as an author, that is a good thing to sign a two book deal, particularly when you're new, like I was, because your publisher is going to be more invested in you if they know they're going to be stuck with you for a second book as well. So that was sort of how it came to be. You know, I just was going to do this one book and I got this offer for two and it was a really generous offer and we figured we could figure it out down the road. And I'm so glad that I did because I'm so proud of Stretch Too Thin. And I think this is a conversation that we need to really be having. We don't have a lot of great resources out there for working moms. And this has been a tipping point for a lot of women. So I'm glad it worked out, but it was certainly not something that I set out to do when the idea for the first book came to me. And would you do it again? Do you have any more books in you now? Any big callings? You know, it's too fresh right now. It it definitely was hard. I found out that I was pregnant with my son, my third, I have two boys, my third child, right during the time that I was writing The Fringe Hours, we actually had to push the pub date back because of my due date. And so I had him New Year's Eve. And then six weeks later, the book came out. And so I never thought that when I was writing 
the fringe hours and had two kids that I would have to do it again with having three <laughs> kids. So right now I'm just really excited that Stretch Too Thin came out as a hardback because the publisher believed in it so much. It's in airport bookstores and Target stores and everywhere books are sold. And so I'm just really enjoying that right now. It'll come out in paperback the next year. So it's hard to say right now. It's possible, but right now nothing has moved forward with that. Do you have any tips to other people, maybe even people as busy as you, if that's possible, to are interested in writing books? I think that you can just start writing. You know, I mean, I wrote The Fringe Hours and Stretch Too Thin literally in my fringe hours. In those little pockets of time, I was able to write two 50,000 word books. So I think just get started. I think it's really important to have representation. So if it's something that you want to pursue having a traditional publisher, I think finding an agent is critical. I think it's very unusual to get a book deal if you don't have somebody representing you. I also think it's really important to build your platform. My understanding is that publishers want to sign authors that have platforms, that have followings, that will be able to help market their book. It's just as important that you can market as it is that you can write, which is not something that authors historically had to do. It's a, a new age. And so it's important to have a platform and build a newsletter list as well, I think, if you're pursuing being an author. And how might you go about accomplishing that? You're very adept in this, in this you have this skill set sort of nailed, I feel like, with your job and everything I've seen you do. What if somebody's trying to build that type of a platform or they have like a band they're trying to market or something with today's framework as it is with social media and everything, what are some of the most important things or the most helpful things even if that they could do to, to achieve that goal? So it's different because I started 12 years ago. So what I did to build my platform isn't what people need to do today, but I think that ultimately it's about having really great content. And if you of content that resonates with people that you're not just throwing up a picture of your cat, right? Like no one is interested in that. Like how can you bring value to somebody's feed every single time they see an image from you on Instagram or on Facebook? So I think write really great content and bring value to people and they're going to keep coming back. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. This episode has been sponsored by Bookhampton, bookhampton.com. Thanks to Ryan and Steve at Texture Sound for the audio editing and mixing. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Mm-hmm.